How did the King of Midland go from this to this? PSA, in this video I am covering some of the more disturbing scenes in the Berserk manga. That includes some unwanted physical advances. Most of y'all are Berserk fans so you've already seen this, but if you rather not see this type of stuff I completely understand. Please feel free to watch some of my other content that's a little more PG. Side side note, for anyone that has watched the anime and they plan to read the manga, some of these parts are not included. So these are technically manga spoilers, even if you've watched the anime up until the eclipse. Housekeeping aside, we're talking about the King of Midland, real name never revealed, and how a spiral into madness is depicted by Moira. In the Master of Swords Chapter 2, we are properly introduced to the King for the first time. He talks casually with Griffith and compliments his ability, sharing his philosophy in regards to elevating competence regardless of social status. In the Battle for Daldry Chapter 1, he entrusts Griffith with the crucially difficult task of taking Daldry, against the wishes of the majority of his generals. We see a man that is capable of making tough, risky choices against popular belief. In Moment of Glory, the king lathers Griffith with praise for taking Daldry and promises gifts and nobility for him and his captains. We see a man that follows through on his word, rewarding excellence and paying little heed to caste. In The Fallen Hawk, the enraged king whips Griffith in an animalistic rage for the crime of treason against the royal family. We see a man lose his composure and exact consequences to protect his naive daughter's dignity. In Demise of a Dream, we see a man try to force himself on his own daughter, possessed by the spirit of lust and depravity. So who is the real king of Midland? Let's start with the setting. Change. Guts decides to leave the hawk to pursue a dream, and Griffith tries to stop it. Guts defeats Griffith leaving Griffith devastated. In a moment of madness and self-sabotage, Griffith sneaks into the princess's bedroom and takes her chastity. A maid hears the moans and creaks from the hall and peeps through the keyhole. She sees Griffith and Charlotte making love and she rushes to inform a superior. Griffith gets captured by the palace guards as he sneaks out in the morning. The king catches wind and rushes to see Charlotte. Charlotte tries to cover her trail, but the king sees her hickeys and rips off her bedsheets. The evidence is overwhelming. For the first time, we see that fatherly regal demeanor shift into shock and horror. Understandably, a man that he put his trust and resources into snuck into his 17-year-old daughter's room and took her virginity. The king has Griffith strung up in a torture chamber. He expresses his disappointment in him, building up all that he could have been if not for his betrayal. His rage boils over as he speaks and he whips Griffith, drawing blood. The king offloads on Griffith about the difficulties of ruling a nation, the constant wars and stresses, his inability to shirk his duties. He is trapped within his role and Charlotte is his only light and happiness, an untainted flower plucked by Griffith. Griffith smiles and politely picks the king apart, telling him that the true reason for his anger was that he wanted to be the one to take Charlotte's virginity. More specifically, he wanted her to want him. In Griffith's estimation, the king is just a lonely old man with no other reason to live than his 17-year-old daughter. Griffith continues by stating that even though the king was born to and inherited the sword called the throne, it was nothing more than a burden to him. All he has done is not fail. Griffith touches a nerve and the king goes crazy, whipping Griffith like a madman, leaving him bloodied and wounded. Griffith simply smiles to the king's horror. The king summons a short, hideous executioner and tells him to do as he wishes with Griffith. He threatens the guards to secrecy as he leaves and tells Griffith that his ambition is over. He has destroyed himself. The hawk has fallen to earth. It will never take flight again. In this scene, Griffith took the most physical damage, but he left the king with an emotional gunshot wound that would never heal. Now this is where the anime only watchers need to sit down. It's about to get mad. After his session with Griffith, the king visits Charlotte. A maid explains that Charlotte is asleep because the doctor gave her a drug to calm her after the most recent events. The king tells the maid to triple up the guards and let no one anywhere near the room. He sits next to his sleeping daughter and touches her face, comparing her likeness to her mother's with age. His expression darkens. So he touched these lips. He pauses. So this body was touched by his tongue and fingers. His jaws loosen and his eyes widen as he pulls down her shirt, leaving his unconscious daughter bare-chested. Charlotte wakes up, naked, to see this. 
She screams and pushes him off of her. Panic takes over the king. He calls her name. Charlotte quivers in fear and calls for Griffith. Upon hearing the name of his daughters first, the king doubles down, leaning into his darkest desires. He holds her down and licks her face, then slides his head between her thighs. She screams for Griffith as she kicks him in the face, breaking his teeth, nose, and injuring his eye. The king curses Griffith's name as he stumbles away, hemorrhaging blood. Charlotte curls into a ball and cries for her lover. These few chapters took me for a ride. From Griffith's night with Charlotte to the king's horrific spiral, there is a lot to analyze here. One thing that caught my attention, outside of the obvious, was the way that Moira represented the king with and without a head covering. In every scene that the king is in, before the dungeon scene with Griffith, he has something on his head and he acts like a ruler. The scene where he whips Griffith is the first time we see him without any head covering, his receding hairline on full display, the crown covering his insecurity. His eyes are wider and he looks more beastly than ever before, sweating, haggard and emotional. This is the real person behind the crown, the man that acts as the king of Midland. Without the crown or a hat, he is no longer acting as king. He shows his true self. When he attempts to have his way with Charlotte, his head still uncovered, his eyes bulging, he looks inhuman. He is a man possessed. In The Lord of the Rings, Gollum is possessed by the desire for the ring and it turns him into a monster. In Berserk, the king is possessed by the lust for his daughter and he turns into a demon. The similarities in design are alarming. As king, he is no stranger to the best. The best foods, clothes, safety, entertainment, and medicine. Nothing is off the menu, except his daughter. When the king took off his crown, he devolved into just another person that wants what they can't have. I think this is the reason we never learn the king's real name. His entire identity is consumed by the crown. Without it, he is just a depraved old lunatic who lusts for his daughter, and Moira depicts this masterfully. Like and subscribe for more content. Comment down below what you think. I reply to every comment. Peace.